contest winners and all the spouses and sponsors who are here, particularly the sponsors who make it possible for us to do this essay contest. We could not do this essay contest without your support. And when you hear the winners speak, you will understand why it is so important that we continue to do this. Before we get started, I would like each spouse in the room to stand, face the audience. Better yet, come up here, please, quickly. You would think they don't do this on a, on a daily basis. This is only <laughs> spouses of the Congressional Black Caucus. Would you please come up to the podium? <laughs> See, this is the emerging leadership that we have, we have to watch out for. Okay. <laughs> Janet Hall, could you please find yourself over here? Quickly. Okay. I just would like you to meet each one of them. They're going to introduce themselves, tell you a little something, where they're from, who their husband or wife is. Where's Holly? Okay. I'm Marita Davis Johnson. My spouse is Hank Johnson. 4th Congressional District from the great state of Georgia. Vera G. Davis, my spouse is Congressman Danny K. Davis from the great state of Illinois. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Ulaida Watt and I'm married to Mel Watt from the 12th District of the great state of North Carolina. I'm Diane Cleaver. My spouse is Emmanuel Cleaver from the 5th Congressional District of Missouri. That's Kansas City, Jackson County, Missouri. My name is Emily England Clyburn. I am from South Carolina. My husband is James E. Clyburn from the 6th Congressional District. Hello, my name is Gwen Towns. I'm the spouse of Ed Towns from the 10th Congressional District of Brooklyn, New York. Good morning. My name is London Thompson. My spouse is Benny Thompson, 2nd Congressional District from the great state of Mississippi. <laughs> Hello, I'm Janet Hall. My spouse was the late Charles C. Diggs, Jr. Um, from the 13th, former 13th District of Michigan. Thank you all. I want to tell you one other thing before they leave. Diane works in human services and health and education. Excuse me. Dr. London Thompson, raise your hand for me. Okay, thank you. Okay. Works in education. Janet Hall works in international affairs with the United Nations Foundation. Gwen Towns, healthcare. Emily Clyburn. <laughs> em Emily Clyburn is married to what? What's Jim's title these days? Hmm? What's Jim's title these days? Um, Jim Clyburn. You see him a lot on TV now. That's he he's the work. majority. <laughs> no, he's the majority whip. They have children grandchildren. She's traveling all over, so maybe she says she doesn't work. I think she works. <laughs> Yolanda Watt works in education. Vera Davis, we do financial services. Retire. Education. 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 Every time I turn around, she's doing something, other project, though, so I'm not sure which one. Uh, this is partner, Marita Davis Johnson. Okay, and my name is Simone Marie Meeks. I work in health care as well. And I'm married to Gregory Meeks from the great state of New York. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, let us start. Thank you, Simone. And uh, Simone, who is the chair of the uh, Congressional Black Spouses, Congressional Black Caucus Spouses has done a great job in promoting uh, this forum and everything that we do throughout the year. So I would like for all of us to give a big round of, of uh, applause for our chairperson, Simone Meeks.
We always look forward to a lively forum, and this year is no exception. We have some very great, very good panelists who will help us explore the topic of youth involvement in our political process. This election year, more than any other, we are seeing youth take the rightful place in leading the way to a new future for all of us. It's an exciting time and an exciting prospect. I want to add a special thanks to all of you who have made this possible, including the CBC staff. So let's give them a hand because they do a tremendous job and work so hard. To, to put this together. We especially want to um, acknowledge and thank our sponsors, uh, Pitney Bowles, <laughs> Hyundai, uh, General Dynamics, I'm sorry, and APRO. Thank you. Without their help, we would not be handing out these checks to our essay winners today. So let's give them a big round of applause. And we are so proud of our essay winners, and, and you will meet them shortly. Again, on behalf of the CBC spouses, we welcome all, and we look forward to a great forum. But before we get started, I would like to have the representative from Pitney Bowles to come up and say a few words. Thank you. And uh, let me be very honest with you. I'm pretty sure my company insisted that we have a couple of moments in the spotlight because they didn't want to write the check unless they knew we were going to get the word about Pitney Bowes out here to you. So <laughs> that said, <laughs> I will say that we are delighted to uh, be sponsoring this essay uh, forum. Uh, we truly believe in the mission of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. We particularly really support and believe in the power of encouraging young people and developing their leadership potential and encouraging them to express themselves and the power of the written word. That is what Pitney Bowes does. We're all about communications um, and the written word and helping it, helping our customers help their customers. So with that, I say thank you. I have read, had the pleasure of reading the winning essays. I am so impressed and thrilled with the talent, the expressiveness, the depth of thought and uh, really excited about these young people who are going to be our leaders of tomorrow. So thank you for allowing us to participate. And, and, and once again, I would like to give a big thank you for General Dynamics. <laughs> and, and with that said, uh, I would like to ask Ms. Uh, Donnell Blackwell to come forward, who is going to be the co-moderator uh, for this event today, and we are very fortunate uh, to have Danielle. Uh, she was the past executive director for the Congressional Black Caucus Spouses. I was not a congressional spouse back then, Danielle, but I heard that you did a fine job <laughs> and that uh, you will do a fine job today. So without further ado, I introduce you to Danielle Blackwell. Thank you. Thank you so much. This, this is truly a blessing for me because uh, any of the spouses can tell you I have history and I love them de deeply, all of them, and so I'm really honored. Um, but, did, but today we're here to honor our wonderful students. You know, the CBC spouses have been about charged with the business of leading the way to supporting the kids for the 33 years that I have known about the CBC spouses. All of their events, I remember I was 17 when I first volunteered for my first fashion show with Dwight Bird and they used to happen at the Hilton. I was 17 years old and I was a volunteer 
and I remember Ms. Hall and Roscoe Dellums and Dorothy Ford and Ms. Carol Clay. Boys, come here, girl, get this. But just being around them is empowering, and I still can call them my mentors today. And just if you will look at the history of all of the scholarship checks that have been given out by the CBC spouses over the past 30 years, and we're talking millions of millions of dollars. I don't know the exact amount. When I was there, I could say 11 million. Um, so I'm sure so much more. But they don't just, and they're not a selfish group because all of the members of Congress are allowed to give out scholarships, spouse or not. And I think that's absolutely, absolutely beautiful for the spouses. So I want to applaud the students who are here. Your essays are wonderful. So of course, I want to introduce you and have you just stand for a moment. Uh, so I want to ask Maurice Hunt from Detroit, our first place winner, to if he could just stand and be acknowledged. I'm sure you'll be brought up later on in the program from Detroit, Michigan. And then we have Kamaria Greenfield from Washington, D.C. All right. Amen. And then we have the lovely Sophia Townsend from Wisconsin. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I, I want to uh, uh, first find out if you want to read the essays first, Chairwoman, or would you like for me to introduce the panelists? <laughs> I said, would you like me to introduce the panelists first? Oh, okay, yes, ma'am. All right, so I have the pleasure of, I was once a member of the organization in college, of introducing Ms. Barbara Sierra uh, from the National Association of Black Journalists. And I don't have to look at this to read this because I know who you are. <laughs> and anyone that's in journalism or media, please know who she is. She's dynamic. I mean, and, and so of course she's an uh, anchor woman, um, a major executive in the news, uh, in the news business. But then she also has time to nationally uh, uh, develop a national association, which I know has major chapters in universities around the country. And so th this is a great task. I want to ask Miss Sierra to please wave to everybody so we all know who she is. Hi there. All right. So yeah. You're connected. If you ever watch t television, listen to radio, read the newspaper, you need to know Miss Sierra. You really do, and especially all of the students. I had the pleasure of working with Paul Braithwaite while I was here, working with the CBC Foundation. So I have history with Paul. Paul was working uh, as the director for the CBC uh, under uh, Congressman Elijah Cummings, which is one of my favorite, favorite members from Baltimore, Maryland. And so he couldn't help but have another dynamic person up under him, and that's Paul. Uh, Paul is a big time now working with Podesta. <laughs> so, so, but he, he, is, he is really a dynamic person. If you need anything, you call Paul. I just, I just asked for something sitting here in the chair, and he had it right there. If you need anything, and all the members know, and all the member spouses know, if you need anything, you call Paul. Um, but he is amazing. And then I have not had the pleasure but have read your bio, so let me cheer you because you are actually what this panel is all about. Start going from here and starting right here, Miss uh, Tamaria. Uh, to, to me, okay, let me get, let me get it right because I got to get her right. Miss Tamika Norton, and she was originally from Guyana, a resident of Atlanta, Georgia, but getting ready to do big things in my city of Washington, D.C. while she's in law school at Howard University. So I want to applaud you. I want to applaud you because you are exactly the transition that this panel, that these spouses uh, uh, have been grooming. You are that person to go from a young contestant, a high school student, to now being where you are. This is what it's all about. And one day, one of these three, if not all of these three, will be up on this panel or some other panel. And so you, you exemplify what it's all about. And I appreciate you. Uh, he isn't here yet, but I, I got to say something about this young man. I, I had the pleasure of hearing him speak in New York. Uh, and at 12 years old, he started his own business. You may have seen him on Montel. And he's a multi-million dollar 
a, a business owner. He's a financial guru, okay? And so can you believe that? And he started that at 12 years old with uh, programming video games. And we all, if you have grandchildren or children, you all know how much those little cartridges and games cost. So you know he's a multi-million dollar uh, mogul there. But now he, he uh, travels the circuits. He's an analyst on Fox News. This is a young person that's an analyst, a young African-American person that's an analyst. So he's not here, but we're going to applaud him anyway because that was a, a major feat. And so the, the spouses and the spouses' staff, they have really put this thing together and put the best of the best together. So uh, my name is Danielle Blackwell. I'm also, like my colleagues, a multitasker. I'm serving as the regional director of the Obama campaign in Georgia. Uh, my phone is going off. I'm going to tell you a little story of what's going on in the second district of Georgia right now as we speak. And this is why this panel is so important, the young people are so important. There's a busload of Job Corps students who went to go early vote, and they were turned away. Why? Because the registrar said, there are too many of you here. We're not set up to receive this many at this time. Come back November the 4th is what they were told in Albany, Georgia. So my phone is, if you hear it buzzing, it's just ringing off the hook. But can you believe that? Yes. Yes, I can. And, this, and so the bus driver and the, the uh, attendant with them, she got them on the bus and she was headed back to Job Corps and I called them back. It just so happens I was, I was with Ambassador uh, Sidney Williams when the call came in and he ter heard me talking and he said, you call them back and you tell them to get on that bus and go back and take the news people with you. And so I did make that call. But this is what we're faced against young people. And it's because our young people, they see young people. They saw a busload of young people and thought they could just tell them any old thing. And so we have to empower our young people. We have to empower you with the knowledge so you can tell your colleagues. And it keeps going on and on and on that you will stand and say, no, can you bring me the code and show me what the code is? Okay, when you go in, in these elections office. So this is what it's all about. And uh, this is why we're here. And so I want to open that up as a discussion topic of how do we keep our young people engaged? Because as you know, we are registering millions across the country. And when that kind of thing happens to them, you don't want them to be able to get back on the bus, sad, go back to Job Corps, and they probably would not have come back November the 4th right so we got to get our young people to where they will say uh-uh no it's early voting here's my voter registration card who's in charge right all right so we, we want to open up that floor to to discuss that and i'm i'm going to start with you sierra because you probably get all the reports on the ground of all these kind of things happening across the country so give us a little insight on on how news media handle those type of reports because I don't see them on the news. Well, I'll tell you, nothing is more exciting than hearing a phone call like that and you would run, not walk, to the location because it's one way of really shedding the light on some of the things that stand in the way between our freedom of choice to vote and what actually happens at, at the polls. We've been getting not only, a, I'm just now hearing about this and after this I'm going to be calling my newsroom <laughs> go to, go to, Albany, Georgia. <laughs> to just to talk about what's happening in Albany Georgia because hopefully by that time you know there'll be some video on the feed that will mm -hmm. tell us about what's happening but um, engaging the young people is about giving them a voice mm -hmm. and I think that in terms of uh, a connection with the community what needs to happen what needs to always happen is for the community to be linked with the media and the reason why I say that is because it is your way of having a voice that's much louder than you can speak. For example, we've, we've been getting a lot of examples of urban legend that have been coming across our table right now regarding the vote. Is it true I will get a phone call or an email that if you wear an Obama t-shirt mm -hmm. on November 4th, you can be turned away because you are a walking, talking billboard. You are a campaign literature. You are campaign literature. And these types of questions are coming across because people are fearful that it will be a recreation of 2000. Mm -hmm. There will be excuses for why they can't vote. So I guess in order to engage them, I would, I would suggest 
that you communicate with your local media now. Tell them those stories. Drop the dime. And in fact, they will love you for it because they want to know what's going on bef while it's happening, not tomorrow. And but I'm going to close this portion of my opinion on this by saying, here's what happens to our youth, in my opinion. And I'm a grandmother of four. I know how this goes, and because I feel like I'm doing it the second time with my grandkids. But what happens is we teach them, teach them, teach them, especially if you're people of color, because we want to teach our kids to respect authority. We always tell them to be mindful of their manners. We want them to represent us well when they go out into the world. But as a result, we're also discouraging them from questioning authority. So I think we also have to give them balance. We also have to say, be respectful. Know when it's appropriate to behave a certain way, but also question authority. That's what I think we need to develop a balance to make sure that our kids don't get turned away in Albany, Georgia. And so, Paul, I want to put a policy perspective on that. And, and how do we get our youth? What do we need to do more um, to get our youth and our members to, to get that word out there so that our people know what is policy? You really won't know what policy is unless you are a geek and you're sitting in front of C-SPAN like I do just to see what they're talking about. So, so when he asks you something, you know. But, but how do we get our young people into policy, not just makers, but policy knowers? Well, well, first of all, thank you all very much for inviting me, Mrs. Meeks and the, and, the, and the CBC staff and all the CBC uh, spouses for being here today. Um, I think we have to go where young people are, and we have to use what they use. Um, they're not doing the, uh, they're not at home sitting in front of a television. Uh, they use their, their two-way text pager. They use their uh, Blackberries. They use new technology to communicate with one another in ways. They use Twitter. They use all these very face, uh, face lick or face Facebook and uh, face uh, Facebook, but it's <laughs> all flick. I'm sorry. Yeah. There's flick. Uh, there's all these different things. And what you'll find is, is as you um, as you talk to them, there are ways that they're communic communicating with one another that we have no idea about. And so, therefore, our leaders and others have to adjust to that. They're not getting their news from the television anymore. They're Aww. not getting their news. No, no disrespect to Barbara. <laughs> um, um, they're, they're, on, they're, on, they're on the Internet, um, on blogs, reading what people say. And so we have to do that. One of the things that Congresswoman Kilpatrick, Chairwoman Kilpatrick, has done as chair of the CBC is she set up a blog mm -hmm. to blog on issues when things happen. And they have been able to get people involved who otherwise wouldn't be uh, otherwise wouldn't be involved. So yeah, we just have to be creative, and we have to do what they're doing. I mean, the, you know, we we can try to reel them in and bring them to where we are, but if that doesn't work, I mean, we've got to figure out. I mean, like we should be. Um, it's funny, um, uh, Anderson Cooper, when he does his show, he says to draw out the show, and we're blogging throughout the hour. That's so that they can reach people who are not going to be watching them on television. And some people are like. Because he, he wants people to go to CNN.com mm -hmm. and respond to whatever it is that they have there, that, that the news as it is, um, that these people, uh, that, they're, that they're getting uh, now. So we, I think we just have to be creative in how we, in how we reach them today. All right. So Tamika, on that level, I know you're affiliated with the NAACP. And what is the NAACP engaging? I, I get emails from them all the time about these kind of disparities. So uh, from a young perspective, what do you do when you hear that kind of story? I think um, the NAACP needs to be more um, seen, I guess, in the community. Like, personally, I really didn't know that the NAACP was so active until I got to college, and I think that's too late. So we need to be out there in the schools doing things so that young people see that these organizations aren't just 1960s organizations. They exist now, and I feel like it's the NAACP's job to go into the schools and educate people. Also, I do think a lot of it stems from our education system, period. Um, I did not get as involved in the political process until I went to college because of my major, and I also think that's too late. Mm -hmm. So maybe organizations like the NAACP need to be stronger in lobbying Congress, lobbying specific states to kind of alter the curriculum so that young people understand what are my voting rights. It shouldn't be, you know, when you become 
22 years old that you learn this stuff. So I do think a lot of it really starts from our education system and just our community organizations being more visible so that young people are able to see these organizations do exist. Should I have a problem, this is an avenue I can take to rectify it. So I want to poll the audience a bit, and I want to see how many people are live within the D.C. area, in the metropolitan. Okay, so a great many of you are out of the network. Yeah, the Beltway. So what is going on in your different communities? Are, I just told you a story about deep rural south, because Albany is way down in the cotton fields. But is that kind of story going on in Wisconsin, Detroit? Yes, ma'am. And so, of course, I have to ask the high school students, are you getting any of this in your high school? Do you hear about voting rights and what, your, what the rules are when you get up to an election, How, what you're supposed to dress like when you're, po you know, do you know those things? And you know I'm going to call you out, Carrie, because I know you're working with the young people uh, originally from uh, Congresswoman uh, Moore's district, but now you're down in Atlanta. Tell us what your organization is doing, because I know you're doing some, some things in, 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 in reaching out to the young people with this campaign. That's, you said 10 cities, so about to, okay, so we really, we're not out there enough, it's, I mean, we, yeah, we're not out there enough, we're not out there enough. You know, part of it, I think, begins at home, you know, we, we often talk about what's happening at school, but what's happening at home, because one of the early learning tools I had a long time ago was Schoolhouse Rock. Well, it's now on DVD. Mm -hmm. And you know, and you, you know, the bill on Capitol Hill, you know, that's how you learned how to do that. You know, and it, it engage you in governance. And I think that one of the things you have to do uh, at home is if you're not getting it outside, uh, you have to bring it inside. And I think that, you know, there needs to be some parental responsibility. If you want them to care about voting, make it happy. You know, sometimes those little tunes, I think, sometimes really help the kids connect to, you know, having a bill travel through Congress. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely, yes, ma'am. Ma'am, can you stand up so we can hear your front and uh
Pesky. So it's okay to listen to Little Wayne and fill out your registration <laughs> form. <laughs> That's good. We were like, no, maybe it won't. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, when we started, we thought, well, maybe it wouldn't work. But at this point, what we're finding is there's a lot of our youth that are coming out that aren't registered. Mm -hmm. They're even my age are still not even registered. Have not voted in years. But they're like, okay, we want to come out. So we've got. A big one on October 10th, um, Club One, which is a, a cl another club down there. We're doing a happy hour from 6 to 9, and we're putting the senator out there. We're bringing everybody in, educating them, and, again, pulling all the promoters again and doing it again because we want to get this done by the 14th. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah. you want this? <laughs> what is the plan? Uh, you're going to get them registered for now. One thing about the group is that uh, in the last election, yes. there were several, uh, quite a few youth that were Right. And I talked to some of the young people between 18 to 35. Yeah, probably right in there. It's a rejected a lot together. You don't have time to, you know, to register to vote. Maybe not time. They just have to take the time. So what is the plan to get those people to the polls? Well, the senator actually, she's talked about actually having shuttles and buses for those, and that's something that we're currently working on because we had the same concerns. And that was our concern. Yes, we do get them out here. We're going to get them signed up. Do they know where to go? Can they go early? Those were all questions that we're having and we're trying to figure out. And we were at this point just setting up local shuttles. And we're starting to do that. And that's something that we looked into because, yes, we, you've got to get them signed, but are they actually going to get up and get out of bed? But first, giving them as much information. We, we're trying to get the pamphlets. People are just not educated. They're in their lives. Right now I'm worried about whether or not I pay my gas bill or whatever. And then they have to understand all that is tied into what is going on. And until you get out there, pay attention, turn on the TV, read and research, which is something we should be taught in the beginning, then it's not going to help our children in the future. We've got a lot of our kids out here, so that's what we have to do first. So that, yes, we are definitely, that's one of the paths we're on. Um, you know, Danielle, let's hear from some of our essay um, uh, recipients. Uh, today and and of course the essay topic was uh, the 2008 election has boosted civil uh, participation among more youth in the United States than any other election year many believe that this increase in political engagement is directly related to the leadership qualities of the potential presidential candidates keeping in mind qualities such as skill in public communication, organization, capacity, and political vision. Explain how one should determine leadership. Has youth involvement in the upcoming presidential election increased based on presidential leadership qualities, or does interesting from similarities of race, gender, or economic status? Sophia, will you come up and read your essay? And let's have a Discussion. There was a time less than 50 years ago when hundreds of black Americans would gather together and strategize protest actions as a hope for change. A time when women were no longer afraid to rise up and find their voices. A time when black fists rose in the air as a sign of unity and strength when it was needed most. A time when women burned their bras, went to work, and abandoned their roles as housewives. A time when segregation and inequality were no longer accepted and tolerated. Now, less than 50 years later, what's, what was once unfathomable and seemingly impossible has become a reality. A woman and an African American, members of two groups that were once at the bottom of the social ladder, are running for the presidency of the United States of America. This is truly history in the making, and it is no surprise that lo such large numbers of young people across the nation have participated in this year's primaries. 
Yes, leadership has neither a color nor gender. However, it can be inferred that the increase in youth involvement is tied to the similarities between the candidates and the voters. This is one of the most exciting, interesting, and diverse elections in the history of the U.S. And today's youth is eager to join in the effort towards a new, unfamiliar face in the White House. When analyzing the makeup of today's youth, one must take into consideration the general characteristics of the Y generation. It is fair to say that we are the reincarnated protesters of the 60s. Members of the Y generation, born roughly between 1977 and 1995, can be, can be seen either advocating or condemning almost anything. This generation has transformed the old picketing and boycotting tactics of the baby boomers into more effective technological forms of protest. In blogs, online petitions, and opinion polls, the Y generation can be associated with activities in which they voice their opinions on topics such as animal testing, fur trade, same-sex marriage, genetic engineering, environmental issues, and so on. Today's youth primarily values change and progressive thinking. Two themes of the, two, two themes the 2008 presidential election has written all over it. The immense differences that lie among the various members of Generation Y cannot truly be fulfilled by one particular candidate, no matter the leadership qualities. Therefore, it seems as if today's youth has relied on the comfort of choosing a leader based upon their similarities in background and the issues they share with the voter. The theory that the surge of young voters is due to youth being able to relate to the candidates on a personal level is very feasible. Even as children, we tend to relate to teachers, superheroes, and people in general better if they share the same experiences or qualities as ourselves. For instance, when the superheroine Wonder Woman first hit the television screen, girls everywhere were filled with a sense of strength and power. Little girls across the U.S. could envision themselves in, red, in a red and blue suit with shiny gold braces, lassoing crim criminals all over the world. There is no need to question why more girls connected with Wonder Woman ra rather than Superman. The answer lies in the similarity in gender. This is in no way, shape, or form discriminatory towards Superman or the opposite sex in general. It is just simply common nature. The same concept is evident in the current election. There should be no surprise if more older white males vote for John McCain simply because there is a resemblance in background or image. On the contrary, if all candidates resembled each other and came from the same type of background with very similar economic statuses, the question would arise about the determination of leadership. Many factors influence how a person leads, whether it be because of the projection and passion in their voice when delivering a speech or the speedy comebacks when engaged, engaged in a heated debate. There's only one true way nearly every American determines leadership. One who can lead has the ability to understand and truly embrace, embrace the complexity and immensity of a task, yet can discover a way to generalize the issue just enough to satisfy everyone while still paying attention to every important detail. As perplexing as it sounds, this is truly the trait we all look for in a leader. The beauty and the ability to lead is that it takes a special person to perform such a difficult task. Whether it be found in a Clinton or an Obama or even a McCain, all Americans, young or old, want to be able to trust that leader to fulfill the needs of everyone. The results of the 2008 election still remain unknown, but the results of this election so far have been ep epical. Republicans have turned into Democrats, People who have never cared about voting have rushed to the polls. Conservatives have become liberal, among many other things. One can only assume why this election has been so influential. But why should we try to decipher the reason behind this newfound motivation to truly carry out our duties as Americans? Instead of trying to understand why such participation in politics has suddenly arisen, we need to ask ourselves why it took so long for us to get to this point. We should not challenge people's true motivation to vote, but sit back be still, and embrace the idea that a change has come and there is hope that a harmonious America is about to become a reality. Thank you. Next up, we will have Kamaria Greenfield from Washington, D.C. sponsors has to uh, kind of move it a little bit and we want to honor the students for all that they've done their essays are in the booklets but we want you to hear from them as well so Sophia what we want to do 
is, in addition to saying how wonderful your essay is, <laughs> is to give you an award. So first thing, please. We're going to have a little presentation here. On behalf of Aaron's and APRO, which is a partner of Aaron's, we are presenting our honorees with a new Sony Bio laptop hey. for them to continue writing yes. and doing what we do best. Thank you so much. And on behalf of the Congressional Black Caucus Spouses, we would like to present this check to you, Thank you. as well. We're going to do this again. Okay. Uh, before we move to the next person reading the essay, which will be our second place, um, we're going to have Hyundai come and present a check. If I could get my spouses to listen to me, could you please come here one sec? Okay. Every, every spouse, please, one as quickly as possible. The Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, as you know, um, accepts contributions and thanks for many people who make it possible to do that. One of those persons today is the Hyundai Corporation. Um, and so, you want to say something about that? Sure, okay. sure. Okay. Well, yeah. 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 up here. Right in there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Same level. Okay, well, while we're... Okay, please. Okay. Well, I'll make it really quick. First of all, on behalf of Hyundai Motor America, we are really proud to be here again for the second year in a row to support the, the Congressional Black Caucus spouses. That is a lot to say. Uh, if there's any doubt about uh, that promise and that vision, the speech, the essay just writ, uh, read by the young lady, I think gives us all the hope and confidence in the world that we do have a youth, we do have a future that's bright and amazing, and I congratulate you. That was an outstanding job, so well done. You know, Hyundai Motor America has been a sponsor of the Congressional Black Caucus Spouses Scholarship Program for a number of years. And so we are proud to be back again this year in 2008 to present a check in the amount of $20,000 in favor of their scholarship program for 2009. So with that, congratulations, have a great conference, and thank you for allowing us to be a part of your activities. Okay, and I'm just going to have to go down yeah. and get everybody in. Okay. Well, we're flexible. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank you. much. Once again, can we applaud them? <laughs> while we're doing this photo thing tomorrow, can you please, please come forward while we're here. It, no, I'm not. Let's go. It's, we wait. One more. Okay, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> Kamara Greenfield, please welcome Kamara Greenfield to the stage. Well, I, um, second place is coming up. We have another spouse that joined us before we introduced each other. I mean, uh, all other spouses, and that is Kim Ellenson from the great state of Minnesota.
Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. In the course of this year's presidential election, the word change has been used more times than anyone would care to count, mostly referring to the policies of candidates. A change would bring beloved troops home from war, and a change would alter the policies practiced in the White House. But a change independent of the candidates and altogether more definite is also taking place in 2008. This change has come from everywhere and yet seems to, appear, to have appeared out of nowhere. It is the changing perspective that Americans have recently had towards this most essential political process. The change can be seen in the incredible voter turnout throughout the primaries, in the t-shirts and the bumper stickers, in the websites and the fundraisers, and in the Democratic primary's sheer size. It can be seen in the huge sign-bearing crowds gathered to hear speeches, speeches in state after state. And can, it can be witnessed in the countless websites, blogs, and internet, internet forums dedicated to the three would-be presidents. Though there are stories of the senior citizens from small towns voting for the first time in their lives, the spotlight has been given to the young people, the 20-somethings, and the older teenagers who find themselves new to the process and wanting to, to take part in every minute of it. Even the qualities that most would expect a competent leader to possess have evolved. Once voters might have want, wanted someone with the iron will to go through with the war, now the wish of many is for that determination to be tempered with, with the open mind to pull out or refocus. Gone are the days when exper experience was valued over the ability to adapt. As the world continues to shrink, the necessity of communication skills becomes evident, and as the Earth's climate becomes more and more unpredictable, the need for some, the need for someone with a clear, reassuring vision becomes steadier. Anyone who has watched the Democratic debates can tell of the new policies proposed by each. Hillary Clinton's universal health care, Barack Obama's pledge to change the elitist political system in Washington. Some would argue that it is the beliefs of the change promising candidates that have prompted such a change in the country's ideas of involvement. Others would say that the Others would say that the sudden increase in interest can be attributed to the introduction of successful diversity in the field once dominated by one gender and race. The candidates, at least in the Democratic field, have come across to some extent the way they, they wanted. They are seen as real people who genuinely care about their people, not just the highest position of power in the country. Though these theories could not be ignored, one could also say that there is another, another more pressing reason why voter turnout has skyrocketed. This reason lies in the times, the ever-changing times. The United States is living in a post-Bush administration, post-9-11 world that must answer to the very real issues of global warming and a depressed economy, among others. It would only be logical just to say that the people most inv invested in making an impact on these issues would be the ones who grew up in this era, the ones who intend to spend the majority of their lives in the new millennium. There is a feeling in me that I am confident is shared by others. It is the feeling that change cannot be put on hold any longer. The reminders of this are daily. It is not uncommon now to see premium gas selling for over $4. One day I heard my mother commiserating with another woman saying how gas used to be a dollar a gallon and even less. The increase in prices has not been g gentle either. People are now much less willing to part with their hard-earned dollars, and yet the rising prices of every in everything from tomatoes to rice to books and clothing demand that they do so. Evidence of economic uncertainty can be seen in the market of real estate, where prices have been driven down by infrequent, infrequent buyers. Where once paying off a house might have been simple, a lost job or unexpected cost can result in, in, foreclosure, in foreclosure within the year. The Washington Post gives even more incentive for change. The death toll of, of American soldiers in Iraq reached 4,000 in March. The number of Iraqi deaths promises a, a far greater number when all is said and done. Everywhere around us, from the internet to the news stations to the newspapers, the cost of resisting radical change is evident. It should come as no surprise that the people most exposed to the media, the young people, are the ones heard clamoring for change the most, the most of all. I would go so far to say that this is one of the most vital elections that this country has seen in recent history. It will determine if there will be a viable plan for leaving the Middle East or if we will remain there as one candidate stated for the next hundred years. It will decide if the millions of working class Americans will get to keep their dignity 
and it will undoubtedly set the tone for decades to come. The youth involvement in this election has increased for various reasons, but the primary one is also the simplest, and the one shared by many, regardless of age. The time has come for change. And on behalf of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation and spouses, here's the money. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I would, uh, I, I would just like to say that she said that her grandmother purchased gas for one dollar a gallon. Now, I don't know how that make me feel, because when I started driving, I could get it for 25 cents a gallon. So, <laughs> so uh, we, we do see how uh, this economy is right now. And now if we could get Mr. Morris Hunt to the stage. Our first place, place winner. winner. Let's all stand. Give him a round of applause. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, before I start, I just want to say when I wrote this essay, I wrote it based on how I felt, but also what the nation was feeling. So, okay, here I go. America's youth are dreamers. They have the audacity of hope. Every generation has its own vision of what the American dream is. Indeed, candidates in order to be elected must connect with these ideals. In this election, there are candidates who connect on all levels, race, gender, and economic status. Taking it one step further, we have candidates who connect in life experiences. As shown by the great increase of minority and youth involvement in this year's campaign, the Democratic frontrunners Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton connect better now than at any other time in, America's, in American history. It is my firm belief that the greater interest of America's minorities and young people in this year's election stem from their similarities to the candidates' race, gender, and economic status. Barack Obama's honesty and straightforwardness appeal most to America's youth, but it is his ability to pair these with pop culture that has capitalized on them. Obama has the sound, the looks, and the message of change young people desire to hear. When music superstars like Bruce Springsteen and Jay-Z come out for Obama, young people listen. His campaign song, Yes We Can, has had over 5 million hits on YouTube on, and Rolling Stone magazine. As a result of the song's popularity, Rolling Stone magazine has placed him on their cover for endorsing him as president. Additionally, many Americans support Obama because they share his youthful struggles. His father abandoned him, separating from his mother when Obama was two. His mixed ethnicity of a Kenyan father, American mother, and Indonesian stepfather created a hybrid family, causing Obama to struggle with another commonality among today's youth, the search for identity. Perhaps as a result of his confusion, when he was a teenager, Obama made bad decisions about the use of drugs and alcohol. His confessions to these negatives have modified them into youth-related positives. It is life-changing when one discovers their identity but it is even more powerful to use that knowledge to succeed. Barack encourages you to become the leaders of their own lives. Of that becomes identity. Most importantly, Obama's accomplishments are what give youth the audacity of hope, that they too can turn their lives around and reach more meaningful goals. He leads by example. Barack does not simply discuss how he can improve the nation's education level. He is living education. He is a graduate of Columbia University, earned a law degree at Harvard, and became the first African-American president of the Harvard Law Review. Obama lives the American dream that so many young people wish to possess. He directs change um, to meaning, meaningful causes with humanitarian value. When he and his wife, Michelle, took the initiative to journey to Africa, 
While there, they were tested for AIDS. Obama's purpose was again to turn a negative into a positive, this time regarding AIDS testing in a place where it is viewed with suspicion and fear. Also, when Obama brought his youth-oriented campaign to Iowa, it gained worldwide recognition. He, earned all, he encouraged all voters under 25 years of age to exercise their right to vote. He emphasized the struggles America's ancestors endured to ensure equal voting rights for all citizens. He phrased it in the historic analogy that you can't know where you're going until you know where you've been. These positive traditional principles are what Obama emphasizes in his speeches. However, he has given them new excitement. Hillary Clinton also brings a new face to this year's election, a female face. She too has tremendous appeal to youth and women. Her platform of change and her concept of the American dream center around youth-oriented issues, education, equal pay, environmental responsibility, reproductive rights, ending the Iraqi war, and others, all concerned with making life better, especially for women and children. Could we expect any, could we expect less from the author of It Takes a Village, a book about all citizens' responsibility to help raise successful children? Also, Clinton put her money where her heart is by donating the proceeds from her book to children's causes around the nation. Like Obama, Clinton has the support of pop culture entertainers and uses youth-inspired technology to get her message out. Eva Longoria, Elton John, America Ferreira, and Ellen DeGeneres are in Hillary's support cabinet, while she also gains support from fans on Facebook, MySpace, and YouTube. Clinton's Facebook page allows users to ask her questions and receive answers. This person-to-person -person form of communication was, of her, was unheard of in past elections. While campaigning, Clinton emphasizes her middle-class roots of a happy childhood spent in Park Ridge, Illinois. However, she also tells how her early dream of becoming an astronaut was lost when she was told those jobs were for men. In her commencement speech at Willesley College, where she was the first student ever selected to give the address, Clinton declared, the challenge now is to practice politics as the art of making what appears to be impossible, possible. Her anything is possible message is especially appealing to young people. Her involvement in programs like the Children's Health Insurance Program and the American Bar Association's Commission on Women in the Profession prove she can get results. Both Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton offer something unique to voters, especially to youth, minorities, and disenfranchised citizens. The dynamic duo presents the opportunity for citizens to see someone outside of the traditional Caucasian male president. Obama summed it up when he said, Americans still believe in an America where anything is possible. They just don't think their leaders do. Additionally, Clinton echoed it when she stated, this election is fundamentally about whether or not the American dream is really attainable. Young people want a president they feel connected to, one who looks like them, one who has gone through the same good and bad experiences they have, and one whose message of the changing American dream reaches them through their cable channels, iPhones, and internet. Indeed, race, gender, and economic status are the deciding factors for youth involvement in this election. Thank all of you in the audience for being very patient with us. And even your peers and in, 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 uh, your seniors in high school, those who are older, and, and uh, begin mentoring and serving as leaders in your community, in your church, um, and in your home. Check your parents. And I see mamas right there. <laughs> but, uh, you know, cousins, and, and, and be your family leader because each one teach one. You are all in a member uh, in an area where you have a CBC member, you have your CBC spouse. Um, become a mentee. Uh, find someone that you can nurture under so you can grow more. All right? God bless you. Congratulations again as well. I, um, I'm inspired by, uh, by listening to you all's uh, uh, work that you did. I remembered as you all were um, uh, giving your speeches, we, we had a similar, it wasn't a contest, but we had it as a, 
as an assignment when I was in 11th grade, we had to do the 1988 uh, presidential election, and there were a whole host of people running, no men, no women. Uh, but uh, Reverend Jackson uh, ran in that race. He also had run in 1984. Um, and I remember for that, my mother had bought me a, a subscription to Time Magazine so I could keep, keep up week to week what was happening. I grew up in Dover, Delaware, and so our paper was a local paper, so we got the local news and we didn't get very much national news. Uh, but still at home in my, in my, um, in my bedroom, I, ha I used to stack them all up in the corner, so I still have them for like three years that are still stacked there in, in the corner. Um, with all of my high school books and the like. And so when you all were talking about this, what you're writing here, when you look back 20 years from now and you, uh, and you read it again, you will have a similar uh, experience. But for us and for me and for you all today, it was about having this exposure, coming here and being around. Uh, and I don't know if you all are going to be here for the rest of the weekend, but being able to see Senator Obama and see members of Congress uh, and see the, the, the men and women who are spouses to them, who helped them get elected. And they'll probably all tell you that if it wasn't for my wife or it wasn't for my <laughs> husband, I wouldn't be here. Uh, but just getting that exposure is, is so amazing and, 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 and wonderful for you all. And so congratulations and the best of luck. I don't have any wonderful words that like Danielle and, uh, and Tamika sort of gave you. They sort of ate them all up. But I'm sure, that, I'm sure the anchor lady to my right will come up and, uh, and, and, and close the deal for us. <laughs> I don't know if I can live up to that promise, but uh, <laughs> I do want to take the opportunity to say how very proud I am of each and every one of you. I listened so closely as each of you read the words, and I have to tell you that it takes a lot to get in front of a group like this at your age and just deliver your message. So I really want to applaud you for being so brave and passionate about, about your thoughts and and putting it on paper and making it sing when you got here. So that means something extra special. I want to thank your parents because I know you just didn't spring from the womb this rise. <laughs> you know, I just want to know. I just want to, you know, I think um, if, if I leave you with anything, because so many people have said so, such sage advice here today, is that. Um, Bring the people close to you closer as you grow. Uh, there's nothing better or wiser or uh, a soft place to fall than your parents and your nuclear family. They are there for you. Uh, as you, you're a youth in this society, and we know how this society is. So hold them close. My, my grandmother used to tell me that children are like lumps of clay because everyone who touches the child leaves an impression. Mm -hmm. So I want you to surround yourself with positive messages and positive people so you'll continue to grow the way you are today. And I just want to thank you for exposing me to your message. You make me proud. I'm not even related. <laughs> so uh, enjoy the rest of your time here in Washington and just sink in the view. Uh, the halls of justice, the, the halls of our laws, what builds this nation springs from these streets. So just appreciate that time here. We want to thank you very much, and I want to, before we close, acknowledge Christine Callier, who is Marita Davis Johnson's mother-in-law. And, and I would like to add something on that, that she is 81 years old. Christine, could you stand? She's 81 years old, will be 82 uh, next month, and has never missed a vote. Okay. <laughs> And my mother, she's not 82, but she's pretty good looking. <laughs> my mother, Eleanor Singh, is sitting here as well. Stand up, Mom. <laughs> and my daughter, Nia Aiana Meeks, is also here because I needed her to hear someone who was much younger than me say the things I want her to hear. So I thank you. You know, I take care of myself, too. Stand up, Nia, and turn around and face these people. So on behalf of the next generation, I thank you. <laughs> and please, come here, both of you, please. Tell, tell the people who this is. Come, come. Yep. This is um, our daughter, Congressman Ellison, and my daughter, Amira Ellison, 
who at the young age of 11 with her 10 year old friend started a children for change in the state of Minnesota Aww. because she was upset that her voice wasn't being heard. So. <laughs> So you see, we have it on all levels. We're covering it all. And I would like to acknowledge that the Chief Operating Officer for the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, Keith Wright, has entered the room. Raise your hand. <laughs> and to conclude my remarks, and not uh, my co-chair's remarks, but to conclude my remarks, I want to acknowledge Aya and Nakia. Please stand up. No, no, not good enough. This truly, you know, following all you guys, calling constantly, you know, I, I can't do it. You know we didn't do that, right? <laughs> so these are the guys. Come on, Aya, stand up again. Nakia, turn around. They are the ones who make this possible. And we thank them very, very much for their hard work and, you know, and bugging the computer companies and good things like that. So thank you very much. And I'm going to turn it over to Marita and we'll end the program. And I just want to end by saying thank you all for coming. It has truly been an exciting afternoon. I'd like to congratulate once again uh, the uh, assay uh, winners. We are so very proud of you, and I'm sure that we will all see good things happen in the future uh, with you. So again, congratulations. And again, I would like to say thank you to our uh, CBC staff because they do a tremendous job and we're very proud of you all as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming.